On Monday, Jimmy and WBOC's Jacqueline Carley interviewed the author of Memoir of a Skipjack. That interview was preempted by WBOC's coverage of the severe weather. We didn't want you to miss Randolph, Georgia's story, so today we're trying again. All right, so Jackie, you've been here have you been, you've been here a year, right? A little, little more than a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to see any skipjacks yet? If I've seen it, I haven't recognized them as for skipjacks. What it, for what it was. Right, okay. Right. There is just something absolutely magical about these boats. They're majestic, they're beautiful, and our next guest's admiration for the skipjack turned into a labor of love, a passion, if you will. We are honored to have him with us today. We'd like to introduce you to author of Memoir of a Skipjack, this is Randolph Jordan. George, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great right. to have you this afternoon. So, you have quite the story to tell, and it all revolves around the skipjack, right? It definitely does. What makes that, what makes a skipjack so special to you? When I first came here, I was from the Midwest. I didn't know skipjacks. Um, they gradually grew on me. They are, as you have said, something magical. They are elegant. There's something about the design that makes them different. But then they are important. They're import they are not just a, a pretty vessel. They are something that stretches us back into the history of, of the Chesapeake Bay. They are the Chesapeake Bay. They are the people of the Chesapeake Bay. And so as time went by, I was taken in by the skipjack. Now, and, and 25 years ago, it says that you came across an aging skipjack called the Martha Lewis. That's true. Tell us about that. My uh, brother-in-law at the time was a shipbuilder. He built some wonderful ships. He had uh, worked, worked on the first uh, Pride of Baltimore. He would worked on two skipjack boats to, to build them. Then he did the Susan Constant, which is a large, large vessel that uh, was an immigrant ship in, uh, it's now in uh, Virginia. And then uh, the Kalmar Nickel in, really? in Delaware. He built that one as well. So uh, we talked about boats. We've always had, I've always had a love of boats. And he and I decided that we would find out everything we could about the skipjacks of the bay. So we set out to looking for them. And in fact, we looked in very particular ways at all of them. We, we photographed them, we talked to the people, we um, uh, made basically a list, an index of the, of the boats, and then in the process decided we'd save one. Hmm. What goes into something like that? The, we, we were looking at one boat down in Crisfield, a little town south of Salisbury that is built upon oyster shells. It is actually, it was a marsh at one time. Behind the museum there, there was a skipjack, or said to be one. So we went down, we climbed on board this boat, and it was not quite derelict, but in sorry shape. And uh, my brother-in-law, Alan Rawl, climbed aboard, was very curious about all the details because he knew all about it. And then he was surprised to find out it was the boat he'd built. Really? <laughs> And it was decaying. It was in sorry shape. And that really set, set the thing off. We uh, then looked for skipjacks that were available to save. We wanted one that wasn't too far gone, too far rotten, because uh, skipjacks are made of wood, yeah. wood rots. Uh, and uh, their, their lifespan is fairly short in general. They, they just rot. The um, found five boats, uh, and this was in 1993. And of the five, we picked one that we thought we could, we could bring back. It wasn't going to be horrendous to do. We were a little bit wrong about that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we found one, and it was Martha Lewis. She was up at, at uh, Tillman Island. Wow. And so this book chronicles it's, that it's project. Really, it's tell, it tells that story, and it tells about how one builds a skipjack, rebuilds a skipjack. It gets into detail more than I think any other book out there on how a skipjack is put together. Wow. It's a boat that didn't just appear out of nowhere. It came from other boats long time ago, back in the early 1800s. People have been fishing for oysters for ever since there have been people here, including the, uh, the uh, Native Americans. Right. And so 
boats were used to get out and, and uh, gather the oysters. The skipjack began to form up, take its shape, around the uh, 1880s, so quite a long time ago. Wow. And it's changed its shape since that time. People have built them in their backyards. Carpenters would even build them. At one time, there were 700, or estimated to be 700, dredging boats on this Chesapeake Bay. Right. And that's a huge number. There were probably another 300 boats that were uh, fishing in other ways at the same time. Um, that was in the days when there were so many oysters that there would never, they would never go away. They would, they they would always be they there. They would always be there. And so, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Is this the book? This is. Book this here? is my book. Yes. Let me see this. I want to see this. That that is fantastic. Memoirs of a skipjack. Okay. So, what makes you want to write this book 25 years later? It was always something that needed to be put down. It was the story was too important to just ignore. But I got busy. Life life got in the way, as they say. Right. And um, but, beginning probably around four years ago, I started to really really work on it, to put it together. I had, um, in the process of, of uh, reconstructing this boat, I decided that I would talk to all the people who had ever dealt with it. And, and I was able to find them. Really? And talk to the, the owners, the builders, the families of the owners and builders, and um, to learn about the culture. What what allowed this particular boat to take its shape. The Chesapeake Bay being shallow means that the boat has to be almost flat. Right. It's wide so that they can carry a large load of, of oysters. It's very low to the water so that you can pull the oysters out of the water. And the people that made this did it by lore, by tradition, um, and a tradition that really goes back into the, beyond the 1880s. So, in talking with them, I learned a lot about why the boat was important to the economy. There used to be 100 times as many oysters in the bay as there are now. Right. We're down to 1% of what it was. Would the you say it's safe to say that he is rather passionate about the skipjack? He certainly knows the history oh of the skipjack. Well, Goodness. I am a come here. I am not somebody that grew up as a, um, as a native right. uh, of the bay. I was not a waterman. I'm an admirer of, of Waterman, but there's something so precious about this particular culture. It is sort of mysterious. Yeah. Maybe not to the people that were, that were slogging every day out in the ice right. and the snow, getting up at three in the morning to, to uh, get out and get oysters, but to somebody from the outside, this, this boat, which is now the, the uh, state boat of Maryland since 1985, um, is um, unique. It's mm -hmm. the last sailing fishing vessel in America. What, what do you predict for the future of the skipjack? Right now, they are in dire straits in terms of their survival, and they have been for some time, with the oyster population going way down uh, for various reasons. The, they, the, uh, an, an income cannot be made very well at all from just dredging oysters. As they, much as you have shared already, there's even more in your book, isn't there? Well, absolutely that. <laughs> well, we don't want to give away the whole book. No, I can't. We could spend the entire show with you today. Mr. George, thank you so much for coming in today. Memoirs of a Skepjack, you need to check this out. <laughs> thank you so much. You're for very welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you. you. Wow. If you want to know more, go to DelmarvaLife.com.